Welcome to the weekend edition of the week from the Scott Talk Studios here in Presswick Airport from Fiona MacDonald, Isla MacLeod and myself, Kenneth Roy. And on this uh, fine Thursday morning, the main story in many of the papers is surely one of the, the great health scares of the year so far, the, the Times Scotland, is it, uh, leads with what it calls a landmark study suggesting, according to the splash headline here, that, uh, quote, Alzheimer's could be passed on by humans, unquote, while the Daily Mail, Scottish Daily Mail, goes further, much further with its front page, you can catch, the word catch is, is heavily underlined, you can catch Alzheimer's. Uh, the Scotsman is a, a lot more sensible about it. It relegates the story to an inside page, as far in as page 11. So what is the truth about this, uh, uh, this landmark study? As so often with health scares, it pays to read the small print from the scientists themselves. In rare, I repeat, rare circumstances, it might be possible to acquire their word, the condition, or at least the brain changes associated with it. Does this mean you can catch Alzheimer's, as the Daily Mail claims? No, certainly not in the sense that you can catch a cold. Alzheimer's is not in that category. So could going to the dentist put you at risk? This is one of, the, one of the fears being put about this morning. The answer is almost certainly not. Extremely remote, say the scientists. So that's the big story of the morning, but the small print, as I say, does repay uh, scrutiny. Anyway, it all made a change from our record-breaking monarch, who yesterday took a choo-choo from Waverley on that Edinburgh suburban line, which now wanders down as far as Tweedbank, uh, on what has been called the Borders Railway. Queen's Borders trip marks twin milestone, as the Scotsman puts it on its front page. I looked in vain, though, for an amusing sketch of the occasion in the, in the Scotsman. It was certainly rich in irony, the occasion, uh, but the paper disappointingly played it straight. Of more interest, perhaps, was her travelling companion, the First Minister, who has, uh, again, I'm... <sighs> relying on the Daily Mail for this information, uh, faced a barrage of criticism from angry nationalists for so warmly welcoming the Queen to Edinburgh. Barrage, it's a great standby, that, that word. Um, uh, good journalist's word. It can mean just about anything. Does it mean, does it mean 10 tweets? Uh, does it mean 10,000 tweets? Uh, the Mail, uh, I'm sorry to say the Mail isn't saying... But I see that in its online edition this morning, it, it published four uh, tweets. Uh, I suppose that could be a barrage. I managed to get to the end of only one of them from someone calling himself Joe Bird. Do these people really exist? Anyway, with a message for Miss Sturgeon which read, Call yourself Scottish nationalist worshipping an Anglo-German queen. Ha! That's uh, H.A. And a splendid testament here to that devolved function of Scottish education, our Joe managed to spell nine words out of ten correctly. Only the word worshipping let him down. Is the Queen not half Scottish? Well, according to uh, Joe Bird, that's Anglo-German, we must b b bow to his superior oh, knowledge, yes. The apparent warmth of the First Minister's greeting and, and the response of at least uh, four of her supporters, the Barrage, uh, does, however, pose an interesting question. In the event of an independent Scotland, and assuming the SNP were the ruling party in the first administration, would it keep the monarchy? Now, she was asked that question yesterday in Edinburgh. Simple enough question. In an independent Scotland, will we keep the monarchy? And it invited a simple yes or no answer. But the First Minister required, I've been counting, required 33 words to answer in the affirmative and was careful to begin with the words my view. But surely it's more than her view. Surely the view of her party as a whole. Only last year the Scottish Government was at pains to emphasise that retention of the monarchy had been SNP policy for the last 50 years. But now suddenly it's only the First Minister's view, a personal opinion. Maybe it's time for a statement of clarification on where the governing party stands on this before the Queen is very much older. Eighteen years ago tomorrow, the 11th of September 1997, 
The second of the devolution referendums resulted in an overwhelming vote for a Scottish Parliament. The turnout on so vital a question was far from impressive, 63%. Of those who did vote, 74% endorsed the plan. The figures make for an interesting comparison. For the Parliament, almost 1.8 million, 200,000 more than voted for independence on a much larger poll last September. Against the Parliament, just over 600,000. Given the size of the electorate, the opposition was close to to derisory. Not a single local authority electorate was opposed to devolution. Five areas, Glasgow, North Lanarkshire, East Ayrshire, Clarkmanninshire and Falkirk, my native borough, they all registered more than 80% in favour, whereas last September only four of the 32 local authority areas voted for outright independence. We've been examining the media coverage of the September 1997 result and how the immediate reaction on the day looks now, with the benefit of hindsight. First, Secretary of State for Scotland, Donald Dewar. Scotland can look forward to a new beginning for a new millennium. Well, wasn't that the truth? But maybe not the way Donald Dewar intended. So in the retrospective soothsaying contest, we're not awarding Donald Dewar more than 3 out of 10. He got it right. But in a wrong sort of way from his point of view. Tony Blair told a crowd of Labour Party workers in in Edinburgh that the vote in favour of devolution would cement rather than break up the union. The truth was, as Mr Blair subsequently admitted in his memoirs, that the then Prime Minister was never a passionate believer in devolution. And just recently he also admitted that he didn't give sufficient thought after the referendum vote to the impact of the result on the national identity of the UK. So Tony Blair gets a big fat zero though full marks for hypocrisy and poor political insight. Jim Wallace, leader of the Scottish Lib Dems, claimed that the success of devolution in Catalonia proved that devolution met the will of the people. It would meet the will of the people of Scotland too, according to Jim Wallace. Catalonia. Hmm. Not perhaps the best example. The natives there are still extremely restless, aren't they? Though to some extent devolution did meet the will of the people of Scotland, the settled will, as somebody else called it, but the will wasn't settled, not a bit of it. The rallies are still quarrelling over it. So a grudging 4 out of 10 for Jim Wallace. Got the will of the people spot on, but underestimated the size of the bequest. The SNP reaction was that the system had been breached and the whole process of change would speed up. That's what they said after the referendum vote. It did. Labour set up a Scottish Parliament within 21 months. Good going. 10 out of 10 to SNPHQ. Except I'm deducting three points. Why? For two reasons. No elected second chamber. Instead, a committee structure that's widely regarded as an ineffective way of scrutinising decisions. Secondly, a flawed electoral system designed to ensure that no single party ever held an overall majority in the Parliament. Fine in theory, enlightened government by collaboration and consensus. A change for all that Westminster rubbish, but a total cock-up in practice. Speeding up the whole process of change, as the SNP uh, said at the time, uh, led to misjudgments for which we are now paying. So, three points deducted. Then there was Alex Salmond. Natch. What did he have to say? According to The Guardian on the 13th of September 1997, Alex Salmond delivered an apocalyptic prophecy... Well pronounced, apocalyptic. Thank you. ...that Scotland would be independent in his lifetime. It's looking good, that one. The latest polls show 53% in favour of independence. There was another one confirming that this morning. Alas, however, not possible to give Eck marks out of 10. It remains a prophecy. Unlike the others, it hasn't yet been tested and found wanting. And we should be careful about the lifetime of Alex Salmond. Didn't he say last September that the independence referendum was a something like a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity? Now he's campaigning for another one. He's a man of many lifetimes, Eric. Or a cat of nine lives. Perhaps what this little retrospective proves is that you can safely discount all of the prophecies of politicians. And now for Isla MacLeod's periodical periodical of the week. What is it today, Isla? This week I've had a look at a typical weekly lads mag, Zoo. I asked for advice from a shop assistant and I was assured that it was one of their best-selling titles of the genre. According to the front cover, Lucy is back! Exclamation mark. Who's Lucy? I don't know, but I'm I'm assuming that she's a long-haired brunette in the front.